Ladies and gentlemen, uh, yeah, so we'll be starting our, our joint meetup event right now. So, yeah, welcome. So, uh, first of all, my name is Danny from Kundiax. So, very happy to see you guys here. So, uh, yeah, we actually didn't have much time to prepare this joint event. So, thank you very much, Habib. Thank you very much, everyone. So, uh, that's how some house rules. Uh, you know, before we start the whole event, uh, need to be mentioned. Uh, house rule number one, because CG will be the exclusive media partner of this event, so we strictly forbid any video sessions at the moment. So if yeah, so please, you know, don't take your phone. You can take photo, but not video streaming. First rule. Second rule: no token discussion. So because we don't want to invite any MS people to come in, say. The storm the door say you guys are speculating, you know, discussing some high school stuff. So so no questions about that. Then third rules, ask whatever questions you want. And then enjoy the night. So today we are pretty happy, you know, we have uh Quantum from uh Patrick from Quantum to join us and then KK from Anico and then Bundex uh Paco and then uh, we have some friends from banks, uh investors uh, our pre-ICO supporters and then general there as well so and then mostly we want to thank to CG to help us to live stream and then to help us to promote the whole event so today the agenda will be um, three teams uh, Quantum, uh, Enigo and Pundiax will do their own latest updates review and then later uh, Howard, Howard from uh, Quantum we do the quantum smart contracts review and then the introductions as well. After that, uh, we'll have a round table discussions with CG, Kundiax, uh, uh, Quantum, uh, and Go. So, yeah, so stay tuned. So, first and foremost, we would like to uh, welcome Quantum, uh, Patrick from Quantum to give the introductions and presentations. So, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, 
So uh, here's Patrick. Uh, I'm from the Quantum Project. I'm the co-founder, and the right now I'm leading the whole project right now. Uh, so that's the first time we are hosting the meetup in Singapore. Uh, very happy to come to here. Uh, I came to Singapore many times, so I like the place. Yeah. Uh, but today uh, we will talk about the quantum and also the Punk DX and also Amigo. And at the end, uh, one of the quantum developer, uh, Hord, he, uh, he will give you some introduction about the quantum smart contracts. Uh, so mainly we will talk about the, uh, the quantum project, the idea behind the quantum, and also uh, what's the quantum's innovation and uh, what's our focus right now. Yeah. Um, also the, the topic today, uh, also we wanted to talk about the uh, the, block, the blockchain current uh, the blockchain uh, project. What's the future for blockchain? Uh, is, is it the currency features, or we want to build something else like the trustless platform? So what's what's the future uh, for the blockchain uh, concept? So we wanted to uh, to uh, uh, give you our understanding of the whole blockchain industry. Yeah. So before we uh, start the topic, uh, I would like to give you a very short introduction uh, about myself. So my name is Patrick, uh, Patrick Dai. Yeah, my Chinese name is Xu uh, Guang uh, Dai. Uh, so, but I use Patrick Dai uh, more in the Western uh, for, for the English name, yeah. So uh, I, myself, I involved in the industry uh, since 2012. So it's very early, it's six years ago. And uh, from that time, I have been in this industry for almost six years. We witnessed so many projects, they success, they fail. So we learned a lot from, from the whole industry. It's not only like this year, the market crash, you know, in 2013, it's crashed uh, even harder. So, but uh, you know, uh, for, the, for this industry, uh, we, needed to, uh, we needed to go through the industry, we need to find out the long-term value. Uh, that's what, uh, what's the quantum's uh, idea and the principle. So that's a reason, like uh, we, uh, we are trying to figure out what's the best way uh, to bring the blockchain technology to the mainstream. Yeah, it's not only about the speculation. It's not only about the trading. It's also about the the basic principles uh, under the technology. Yeah, we, you need to create something valuable. Can offering people the service. Can offering people the new products. Then you have the chance to become success. Uh, okay, so uh, first I will uh, go through the whole idea uh, about the cryptocurrency, about the blockchain, uh, about the trustless platform. Also, uh, I will go through the token economy because everyone is talking about the tokens. Yeah, I, I'm not sure like how many people uh, really understand the history of the all the tokens. Yeah, we will go through the token economy. Yeah, we will go through like what's the key concept behind the blockchain industry. And at the, end, at the end, I will give you the introduction about the uh, quantum innovation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, still, I think most a lot of people. Uh, I don't know if you have a very uh, clear understanding of the blockchain. Yeah, and also about the cryptocurrency. Even everyone is talking about the cryptocurrency, and also about the token economy and the, the, the trustless platform, and also the, uh, what we are focusing, uh, focusing uh, right now, yeah. Okay. So the, the blockchain, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a very popular concept for everyone, like uh, for all the banks, for all the supply chain. Everyone wanted to know what, what's a blockchain and how can they do their business on the blockchain, yeah, or well, based on the blockchain, yeah. But the, the hard truth is like, uh, not everything, really needed the blockchain. The blockchain have a very specific use case, yeah. So if you are building some new business, uh, it's not about like, a, oh, I have to use blockchain. It's not like that. Because all the traditional software, uh, the past 30 years, only the traditional IT service is very mature right now. So they can, they can give you a better service rather than blockchain and a lot of those scenarios. But some use case, yeah, you need the blockchain. Uh, Okay, so I use this map, uh, this map many times. Yeah, the blockchain is about a, is a protocol. It's the first time on the internet we can trace, uh, we can transfer the value peer to peer, and based on the protocol, we can create some great business models. Yeah, like today, all the Google, Facebook, they build their business model based on the centralized, uh, based on the centralized uh, business model. 
like a, uh, if, I mean, they build everything based on the basic protocol, like they base everything uh, based on the TCP IP protocol, because they get all the information, they get all the knowledge, and they redistribute it to you. Yeah, they, they can transfer the information on the internet for free, uh, without any, uh, it's a high frequency and, a very, and a free. That's a, that's a really like why Google can build this kind, this kind of a business model. Because they organize all the information and redistribute it to all the users. But the blockchain is a very different concept. The blockchain is they want to transfer the value peer to peer without any third party, without any middleman. Yeah. So it's have some very uh, some very uh, different features. Uh, like I list some of the feature. Yeah, it's it's a it's a peer to peer network, and it's also uh, it's changing the. Uh, it's also changing the, how we organize the information. Because earlier, you know, uh, all the information is, uh, we call it the information asymmetry. Yeah, the, the, the information uh, asymmetry. What's the meaning of the information asymmetry? It's like it means someone always have, have like uh, more information than you. That's how they can build the, their business model. Like all the banks, you give you the money, you, you give the money to the bank, then you know nothing about your money, yeah. And uh, for all these centralized business models, it's, they all take the advantage of the information because they always have more information than you. Yeah. So, but the blockchain, like the the, the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network, uh, okay, uh, like like the Bitcoin network, uh, even uh, like the Bitcoin network with one phone nodes, you can get all the whole information through the Bitcoin network. You can verify the global ledger. You can verify every transaction that happened in the last nine years. Yeah, it's impossible for you to verify all the banks' transaction. It's it's just impossible. But the the, the blockchain give give this kind of a possibility, and also uh, I think you know a very important thing about the blockchain uh, change to our thinking model, to change to our business, and change to our society is like uh, it's create a new way how can we organize uh, our resource. It's create a new way how how do, how can you, how can we build our business model. Because earlier, all the business model is based on the trust. But the trust comes from some trust service provider. It's the, the provider is a third party. I stand here. Oh, OK. OK, I'm just stand here. Sorry. Uh, so so the, uh, the, because all the business model is based on the trust service. But earlier, all the trust service is provided by some, uh, maybe by the government. Uh, or maybe by the central bank, or maybe by some third party, or middle bank, even by Uber or by Alibaba. Yeah, but uh, you know, this kind of trust it still depends on the people's performance. It still depends on people's, uh, you, you trust on the people. Yeah, or any escrow service or any business you, you, you are building today. But the Bitcoin network or the Ethereum network, they create a new model. Like your trust is not really based on the people. Your, your trust is based on the, the, the mathematics and the computer science behind the platform. And the platform is, is transparent. Everyone can audit the platform. So no one can cheat on the platform. So that's a, that's a very different uh, very different from all the current like business model. So the blockchain really need a, a change from the trust, from the trust to trust lease. The trust lease means like you do not need anyone to build your trust, but you can still have the trust. So that's a very different concept. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, then let's talk about the cryptocurrency. The Bitcoin is the, is the first successful cryptocurrency, uh, like uh, create a global influence. Like uh, it's very hard to imagine, like uh, uh, there's Bitcoin is a network, like uh, connect like people from more than 100 countries without any central company behind this. You know, the biggest bank network, they have a lot of employees, they have a lot of office all over the world. But what's the office for Bitcoin? Bitcoin have no office, Bitcoin have no company structure. But at the, like, like last year, at the highest point, the Bitcoin market cap almost 500 billion USD dollar. So it's only take like eight years for Bitcoin network to, uh, to achieve 500 billion dollars. But it's take Apple, the greatest company in the world right now, is to take Apple 30 years to achieve 500 million USD dollar. So what, what's the what's a, what's a difference? Yeah. So the difference is like the Bitcoin really give people this uh, very strong motivation, a very strong incentive 
So everyone wanted to contribute to the Bitcoin network. And also, after your contribution, uh, you know you will get uh, you will get the reward. That's the reason you know. I uh, I know a lot of miners in China. They from the west of China. They are working hard. Why they are working hard for Bitcoin network? They are mining every day. Yeah. The reason is uh, they are one hundred percent confidence. Like they, they can make sure if they are keep mining, they can get a reward. Yeah. So that's a really uh, it's a very clear ledger to record everyone's contribution, and also it's like a. It's a very clear like a reward system can give people the incentive. It's really different from the company reward system or the company incentive. Yeah. Anyway, the Bitcoin network is the first network wanted to create a peer-to-peer -peer electronic uh, e-cash transfer system uh, globally, and uh, they are very successful right now. Uh, but also, uh, there is a lot of key ideas behind the cryptocurrency. Everyone is talking about the cryptocurrency. So what's the key ideas behind the cryptocurrency? Uh, the first is it should be a peer-to-peer -peer network. That's a basic principle for the Bitcoin network. What's the meaning for peer-to-peer? -peer? The peer-to-peer -peer means like, a, it's like a, a no, no privilege node on the network. Everyone is equal on the network. And everyone is like, a, uh, you are the peers of others. You have a, it's an equal network. Like a, for the Bitcoin miner, no matter how big you are or how small you are, you, you still have the same possibility. Uh, or you, have the, you always have the possibility to verify all the transactions for the whole world. So that's a possibility the Bitcoin gives to people. Even today, you can do the solo mining. But it's, it's very hard right now. But you still have the possibility. You can mine a Bitcoin block. So, so, the, so the core idea is a peer-to-peer -peer network. You do not need to give your right to someone else. Uh, because if you want to give your right to someone else, then you can, you can go to the bank. Or you can, you, you can transfer your right to someone else. That's a, that's a very big difference. Yeah. But it also it means a very strong res responsibility for your own asset. Because if you are the peers and the others, no one can take the responsibility for you. Not, not even the government or even the banks, because we do not have a central point on the Bitcoin network. Everyone is equal and peer. And also, uh, the Bitcoin network is a permissionless network. It's a permissionless innovation. That's also very important for the successful for the success of Bitcoin, because everyone, if you wanted to obey the basic, the minimum rules, principles of Bitcoin, you can join the network. And you can create the network at any time. So that's really different. Like, I mean, all the innovation, uh, like uh, all the innovation, like supported by the government or by the company, they always set set their own like a target. They always set their own rules. Yeah. But the Bitcoin is permissionless. You do not need to ask any permission from anyone uh, to join Bitcoin network. You can join by your own decision. Yeah. So it's, that's a very different feature. And also, yeah, we talk about the information symmetry. The information symmetry means like everyone have the same information on the network. No one can take more information. Uh, no one can have more information than you. So that's become very disruptive for the old traditional business model. Because like uh, all the uh, traditional business model base, basically ba build on, I have more information than you, so I can charge you money. Yeah, or I can sell my information to you. So that's really different. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's kind of lead uh, some new business model like a Bitcoin network, like a Ethereum network, or like a quantum network. And also, the Bitcoin uh, support a very high efficiency to manage your money. You can use a multi signature. You can use the signature to transfer the money. They have a five standard transaction type. You can transfer your money if you know Bitcoin network very well. It's even safer than the, than the safe box in the bank. Yeah, because it's some virtual asset uh, on the global computer. It, it's not. It cannot be affected by the by the war or by some other uh, some, some other accident. Yeah. So the Bitcoin is a virtual asset, and also the Bitcoin network is very simple, secure, stable, store of the value. Yeah. And also, uh, why it's very important for the information symmetry because the information symmetry can lead to the consensus and lead to the trustless. Because if everyone have the same information on the network, then no one can cheat other people. Because I got all the information and you have, then how can you uh, how can you uh, cheat on the network? It's impossible. Yeah, and also, uh, but you, but you know the Bitcoin take a long way to achieve current states. It's almost nine years. 
other people still are trying to understand what's in the Bitcoin, what's a Bitcoin network, what's the difference, what's a cryptocurrency. So we need to ask ourselves, is Bitcoin a currency religion or is Bitcoin just a, a very huge software? Yeah, so that depends on how you understand Bitcoin. Yeah, is, is it a, a if, it's, if we, Bitcoin is a very big software, then we can make the software better, yeah. But if it's a religion, then no one can change the religion. Yeah, so we need to ask ourselves. Yeah. And also, but you know, the cryptocurrency is supposed to be a long way to go because the cryptocurrency is something uh, so different, something so new. Yeah, it's something very, very different from our our financial world. So it's supposed to be a long-term confliction with all the regulator, with all the regulation, with the, with all the consumer, with everyone. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna be, uh, uh, maybe I will try to explain the idea uh, in shorter sentence, yeah. So let, let's talk about the token economy. Uh, everyone is talking about the token economy, so what's, uh, what's the meaning of the token economy? Yeah, so basically uh, all the tokens, it's, they open a new window for the people's collaboration and cooperation. Uh, earlier we cooperated based on the company structure, but right now, uh, we can, we can, if we have a token, everyone holding the token, so we are, uh, we bas basically we build a virtual organization, connect people together, not, not through the shares of the company, or not through something else, it's through a virtual organization, and also it's a more flexible organization, it's a virtual organization on the blockchain protocol. And also it can change uh, uh, the business from centralized to a decentralized business, and also, a very different thing about all the tokens is like it's changing the consumer to the coin holder or the, to the shareholder. Like uh, everyone, maybe you are using a lot of uh, service, internet service, maybe Google, Facebook, but you are just only a consumer. You are not the shareholder of the company. But for Bitcoin, if you are if you are using Bitcoin, you are the consumer, you are the promoter, you are also one of the shareholder of the whole network. So that's a big difference. And also, yeah, the reason why we have the token bubbles like last year or even today, I think, is because still we have the regulatory gaps. I mean, the regulator, they didn't really realize what's, what's, what's a new technology is trying to create. Yeah, they, they are behind the technology right now. And, uh, but it's very disruptive. All the tokens are very disruptive. But it, today, we still do not have the valuation model. So tell me what's the reason why Bitcoin was like 10 cents USD dollar and uh, Ethereum was maybe some other price or coin was like $20 uh, and some coin was $1. What's the difference? Yeah, Technically speaking, okay, they are all the tokens. They are, all, they are just a simple on, on the blockchain network. So what's the big difference behind this? Yeah, And uh, yeah, I mean, since we have more and more tokens and no barrier to release any tokens, so supposed to have some like a token bubble, the long tail bubble. I mean, some, some very good asset. I mean, uh, there's some good asset, but still, we still have some bubble asset. There's a lot of a token there's meaningless, or have no use case at all. Yeah, at least uh, a lot of thinking about the tokens. I will not go through all the ideas, but basically, it's like uh, the token is not a new concept. It's already, uh, we, have, we had this kind of concept since 2013, and I, the first one is like the card coin, yeah. And also, uh, but the token can lead to another a very interesting area we call it the crypto economy. Yeah, it's some new economy, maybe a more accurate economy than the like microeconomics. Yeah, so it can lead to some new uh, economy, maybe theory uh, in the future. And uh, also the, the token can help us build a more like flexible or like an organization. And the token can inspire people's more creative work. Yeah. And the token will change the consumer to shareholder or the interested party. Yeah. So you can really, if you use it in the right way, it can really accelerate the growth of the business. But also, like, uh, you know, but still for the token economy, if we want to go to the mainstream, we need the uh, we need a lot of legal framework from the government, the tax, uh, the the virtual organization, the, the auditing, and the global cooperation. It's, a, it's something very early, so we need a lot of work. Yeah, so this map is basically the token bubbles. Uh, not, not only the token bubbles, all the new technology, they always, people are always irrational, crazy on the new technology. We have the real-way bubble, 
you have the internet bubble. Yeah, I think it happened on the big on, on the blockchain industry too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we talk about the cryptocurrency. We talk about the the tokens. Yeah. Also, I wanted to talk about the platform. Yeah. So what's the meaning of the platform? Uh, I mean. Uh, until Ethereum came out, everyone is talking about the cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, uh, Litecoin, Dogecoin, all these is just a purely cryptocurrency. You cannot build any application based on the cryptocurrency layer, it's impossible. But then Ethereum came out, we have the smart contracts ability, uh, we have the, uh, we have like, uh, we can program our own business on the smart contracts, yeah. But there, this kind of two, this two idea is really different. What they wanted to achieve is really different. The cryptocurrency have limited flexibility. You can, the, the core idea is decentralization, secure, stable, uh, store the value, and the payment service. But for the platform, it's another concept. The platform need to, need to have like infinite, infinite flexibility. That means the platform can support like 10,000 applications, maybe more, a lot of applications in the future. And that, then we need a smart contracts. We need a uh, scalability, uh, we need a privacy and independence uh, from all the dApps. And then we need a, the founding model beyond the ICO, not only the ICO, yeah. We need a, some like a governance model, like who can make a decision for a decentralized network. So that's, a, that's the core idea behind our platform. So basically, I mean, uh, Bitcoin, they, they, they designed it to be a currency and Ethereum wanted to become a platform. So but quantum, we are doing something different. We based on the Bitcoin network. We, we designed some layer of design. So quantum have a different layer. The basic layer is the currency layer. Then, then we have the virtual layer. And then we have the platform layer. So we support it right now, we are compatible with the Ethereum virtual machine. But we are supporting the quantum x86. So it's a new virtual machine. People can program smart contracts in C language or C++ language. Yeah, so this is the map for big, uh, for Bitcoin networks. They have 10,000 nodes overall, uh, more than 100, 165 countries. So this today, this is the quantum map. We have about 7,000 nodes, uh, more than 65 countries. And uh, different things, like Bitcoin already take eight years, but quantum only take like half a year. So it's something growing very fast, yeah. And it also, very differently, it's like a Bitcoin, you need the proof of work, you need the mining. And the quantum is the proof of stake. So you do not need the mining equipment to maintain the network. It's, a, uh, it's a become the, one of the biggest proof of stake network in the world right now. Yeah, there's some different ideas behind the trustless platform. Uh, I mean, I just wanted to highlight like uh, oh, the smart contracts. What's the, what's the meaning for smart contracts? The smart contract basically is a, it's a virtual agency or a virtual person. Uh, on the on the network, yeah. If you want to do a lot of business, usually you need to hire a lot of people. Why you need to hire a lot of people? Because you need you need them to process uh, your business, yeah. But you know, maybe later you can virtualize a lot of people through the smart contracts, yeah. So that's a very difference. And the smart contracts is like a, your virtual agency. They can help you handle your business, yeah. So that's that's a basic idea why we need the smart contract because it creates some virtual um, uh, virtual uh, productivity. Yeah, it's not the real productivity, but it's a virtual productivity. But even the virtual productivity it can help accelerate or or like lower your cost, uh, lower the cost when you're doing the business. Okay, so we have a, a lot of reasons like why we build the quantum platform. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a long story, so I will cut it in short, yeah. So the reason is like, uh, we believe in the open source software evolution. We have Bitcoin, we have Ethereum. So based on the, based on the two ecosystem, we want to make something better. And also, Quantum have different design idea. Bitcoin is a currency, Ethereum is a platform. Quantum want to do a layered design. So we have a layered design, so we can take advantage of the two ecosystem. And also, uh, we, we build a better governance model, the quantum decentralized governance model. We can involve many, one, uh, many people to, to make a decision together for the quantum network through the smart contracts. Yeah. And also, uh, it's different from the proof of work. We are quantum using the proof of stake from the first day, from the day one. So it's very green, very fast, and it's more business friendly. And also, like, uh, we are building some new virtual machine. 
next one. Yeah. So what's a quantum innovation? I mean, we make a quantum, it happens through some very uh, three key designs. The first one is the quantum AL. What's what's the quantum AL? This is a, a called the overstretching layer. Because the Bitcoin network have no smart contract ability. So at the initial idea, the, the very beginning idea of quantum, we, we, it's very simple. We want to give the smart contract ability to Bitcoin network. So how can we make it happen? It's very hard, yeah. So we build a, a virtual layer. We call it a, a called the overstretching layer. Through this virtual layer, we can connect the Bitcoin's transaction model, the UTXO, with the, with the virtual machine together. So this virtual layer is like a bridge to connect all the Bitcoin technology to the Ethereum EVM. And it can, not, it can also connect to the quantum x86. It's a new virtual machine we are building. People can write smart contracts more easier. And also, uh, yeah, quantum is using the proof of stake. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a something, I mean, Bitcoin is a proof of work, Ethereum is a proof of work. And even Ethereum wanted to change it to proof of stake, but it will take a long time, maybe longer time, yeah. So quantum is already running the one of the biggest proof of stake network, yeah. And also, we made some uh, great innovations on the quantum network. Like a, a very huge challenge for the blockchain industry is like, a, how can you update your software? How can you achieve a better governance model? Like for Bitcoin, the hard fork, like one megabyte to two megabytes. They, they, they fight with each other for three years to, to change a parameter in the Bitcoin network. If you think if you think it's a software, it's really ridiculous, yeah. But if you think it's a religion, then it's okay, yeah. But uh, I mean, from our understanding, we want the blockchain become an infrastructure. So it's a huge software. We need, up, we need to upgrade, yeah. So how can you make a decision? You need to, make, you need to design some mechanism for people to make a decision together. So how do we design the decentralized governance protocol to make the software upgrade uh, more easier when you compare to Bitcoin or Ethereum? Yeah, okay, so uh, what's our uh, current focus right now? Yeah, we, uh, after we release the network, uh, everything uh, went smoothly, and we released uh, like 20, 23, uh, 23 different versions of quantum. So the whole team is working very hard. Yeah, and we every two weeks we have a new version release. Yeah. So after that, we are still working on something very exciting. Yeah, the first one is the quantum x86. It's a new virtual machine. Uh, uh, after this new virtual machine release, uh, in the next few months, uh, the developer will feel it's more easier uh, to do some programming on quantum. Uh, to use a smart contract because we support the majority programming language like C, C++, Python, uh, Rust, or some other programming language. Yeah, so it's gonna be easier for you to build applications on Quantum. And also, we are doing a Quantum Enterprise version because all the enterprise they still want more control. They still need the proof of authority. They still need the identity. You you still need a, a, some specific need for the for the enterprise. All the banking service, all the supply chain. And also, quantum, we are building the layer two solution. What's the meaning of layer two? The layer two wanted to solve the scalability problem. Right now, the layer one is like the basic consensus, proof of work, proof of stake. But it cannot solve the scalability problem. So we, we need to build some upper layer. We want to build the layer two solution. So the basic layer is still as decentralized as possible. Then we build the layer two. The layer two can, can be kind of centralized, but offer more efficiency. Yeah, so, so that's that's something we are building right now. Yeah, it's like the lighting network, state channel, or all these the payment channels. You can really make the network more scale. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I want to introduce the team because it's a huge project. It uh, cannot be finished by one guy or two guys. Yeah, so the team is we have 40 team members globally uh, in China, uh, in, uh, in uh, Sweden, in US. Yeah, so it's a really a global team. Yeah. And uh, we have uh, we have Neil. Uh, he's our CTO, and we have Jordan Earls. Yeah, he lives in the US. He is uh, uh, our lead developer. Yeah, but we also have team member earlier uh, from China, like worked for Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, and uh, Nasdaq. Yeah, so we we have very uh, we have a great team, great developer. Yeah, they are they are working hard to deliver one of the best platform. Okay, so thank you very much. Here's my email. So you can reach me through the email address. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you, Patrick. So, uh, yeah, good, you know, a good presentation from Patrick. And then uh, later we will we would like to invite uh, Anigo.
uh, which is a DApp from uh, built upon uh, Quantum as well. So welcome, AJ. Stay, the floor is yours. So uh, any goal, uh, we are the uh, dev based on content. So what we are doing? So any goal, it's just like uh, so. The first time we had this name is because we want to do the energy free to go. So we name it any goal. So what we do? So we want to shape a new energy future. So let's say blockchain enables smart grid. So we uh, implement the blockchain in energy sector to help people to build a decentralized autonomous energy community in which people can just, when they, when they need the renewable energy, they just download from the network. When they have access to renewable energy, they just upload to the network. That is super easy and uh, without, uh, with the blockchain in our solution, so people can make the middleman in our solution. So why blockchain? I think uh, a lot of you, you definitely know what is the blockchain. Um, but uh, the, the blockchain, the, what's, what the value of us uh, to bring the blockchain in our solution is everyone becomes a uh, consumer. Uh, let's think about it. So every day right now we're using the grab, we just get into the cars, which cars are all from the strangers, we don't know who they are. And also we use the Airbnb, so we may uh, like lie on the bus and all the people we never met. So this is blockchain, what blockchain brings into our DAE uh, community is everyone becomes a consumer and uh, they are not only a consumer and a producer, right now they are a consumer. And by using the blockchain, we, re uh, we will build a de uh, decentralized autonomous energy community. So what is the autonomous? So uh, because in, uh, by using blockchain, it allows people to determine what of the value uh, to the blockchain because each of the country, uh, uh, because each of the transaction will be recorded in this <coughs> network. So right now we we don't need a centralized authority to determine what your value to this blockchain network. Um, that is a typical DAE community in the world. Um, uh, this is a community in the Bay Area. So you see in this picture we have. Some users they have in, they have already installed the solar panels, and also there are some users they have the EV car and the charging, and also there are some users they have in, in, installed uh, the energy storage. So within this uh, within this community, people they can just download and upload their renewable energy as they please. So anyway, we prepared a video for all of you to know exactly what we're doing. So it's a Lego animation video from ourselves. So we built every block of the Lego in the community. So we have the solar panels, the EV, and all the charging in this uh, community. So maybe it's a time to promote our website. So you just log on to www.anigolabs.com and you can check the, the full-length video.
So what is the what is the detailed scenario in our solution? So if you have installed a solar panel, uh, right now what we can do is after you generate renewable energy, you have to if you have access renewable energy, you have to sell back to the grid and then you can get a feed-in tariff. But in our solution, first you can generate your renewable energy and all the renewable energy will turn from a physical asset to a digital asset by our blockchain enabled smart meters. And all the data, how much renewable energy you have used and how much renewable energy you have generated, all this data will get logged in our blockchain network. And physically, all the renewable energy you want to use and you want to store, the, all the excess renewable energy will go to the a physical distributed energy storage. So if there is another energy consumer, they want to buy uh, economic benefits of renewable energy, what they need to do is they just log on our application and uh, have the deal in our application. So when the, uh, when the needs meet the demands and all the transactions will be exacted uh, automatically, and all the when the transaction is confirmed, all the transaction and the work is, uh, will get recorded in our blockchain network. And finally, the user, they can just get the renewable energy from the energy storage again. So it's super easy. Uh, let's talk about why we use blockchain. Uh, so there are a lot of projects there doing the, more and more projects there doing the, radio, uh, the blockchain and the energy relevance. But we think the problem for the users is not the peer-to-peer. -peer. So let's say a very interesting story. So like last uh, November, when we went, uh, went to the Luxor Asia in Singapore, so uh, I, I took a cab, so I asked the driver, do you think your electricity price is expensive? He said, hell yes. And I asked him how much you have paid. He said, yeah, I don't know. So any one of you, you know you have, how much you have paid the electricity bill? Just raise your hand. Okay, I think we have over 60 people, but we only have like four people who know how much exactly you have paid for your electricity bill. So you see there is some problem in, in the centralized electricity markets. Uh, we are a passive user in electricity. We, know, we don't know how much we have paid, and we, don't know, we even don't know how much we, pay, we have paid for the service fee, transmission fee, and the, distribu and the distribution fee. So by using our blockchain solution, we can turn the passive user to a active user. They can check all their energy relevant data, and they can choose where is the energy from. And at last, they can choose the price, different price of their energy they want to use. So uh, in our solution, there are like two tokens. One is what? Actually, what is a unit back, um, back uh, um, from the blockchain to help people, daily users, they can, they can remember how much renewable energy you have used. So what is a blockchain-based digital asset whose value is backed by, by energy? Each, each watt represents uh, one kilowatt of energy. So another token is, so we call it TSL. So TSL is not the transaction fee, it's not the commission fee, it's not the service fee. TSL is, uh, uh, is, uh, represents the access to the energy storage network. For example, there are a lot of, actually the, the main problem for the renewable energy is every day there are like tons of gigawatts of renewable energy they have been generated in remote areas and all the big companies, they get a lot of feeding tariff from the government and that's finished because there is there is no single user in these remote areas. So what we do is we encourage people, users, they can, uh, they can consume the locally produced renewable energy first. So when the renewable energy is insufficient, they, can, they always can get the grid uh, from the centralized grid as usual. So instead of the markets, right now we have the network, and instead of the ownership, right now we have the access. I think that's the transformation from before to now. So let's see what else we can do in uh, by blockchain energy space. First is the peer-to-peer -peer energy training, and second, charging station energy sh storage sharing. That's what we are focusing now. And also we can do the REC trading, the carbon trading certificates, green ABS finance, and the DER system. Um, actually, our project is, uh, we began this project in 2016. Um, October, so it's almost like one year and a half. 
And last year we just begin uh, we begin the first POC project in the Philippines with the local campus microgrid and the local energy company. So this first POC project is a campus microgrid with three different buildings. One building is installed of the solar panel and two of the buildings they don't have the ability to it. And uh, within this campus microgrid, right now the data shows us we can save 1.2 million pesos for this microgrid. And I think uh, this project, it just uh, we just finished the phase one uh, last month in March. So we just finished uh, also the first uh, workshop to the uh, university with the local students. And uh, we are beginning to have the phase two, which we will have 60 users into this project. So that's our marketplace. First, uh, definitely, I think, uh, yeah, um, I think last year is a very uh, great year for NFLS because um, within one year we achieved lots, like zero to one, we achieved the first pilot project and then we grow the team from two people to 30 people from 10 different countries and all these people, we are all based in Shanghai. And also, uh, that these are all the markets we have already entered and uh, there are some markets we are going to enter. And by the way, Singapore will be our uh, south, the whole Southeast Asia regional hub from Envo Labs. And right now we only focus Southeast Asia. So let's see, how many people in the world right now? Do you know how many people in the world? There are like over 75 billion people in the global world. But the problem is, is even this 2020, almost 2020, there's still one billion people, they don't have the access to the electricity. So have you ever considered this? I mean, if it's happened 20, 20 years, I can understand, but right now it's 2020. So we're using the iPhone, iPad, iMac, I, everything, but there are still one billion people, they don't have the electricity. So the problem, and the, I think what we see from this problem is we want to use the blockchain with the decentralized renewable energy to these remote areas. For these remote areas, they may just pass from the centralized grid to a decentralized grid. Um, the problem for these areas is because they are mostly from the remote areas, so the infrastructure cost for the local governments is super expensive, and that's why they don't have the uh, infrastructure there. And uh, that's the chance we see from this from the market. So that's why now we only focus the Southeast Asia countries. And that's the team. Uh, my name is Yang Kai Kai, so I'm the co-founder and the CEO. So actually I have learned jazz drumming for 20 years, so I was a jazz drummer for over 10 years. So, but I, I, I taught a lot of lessons in my college, so I earn a little bit of money, and in my college I get to know Bitcoin, so I use my random money to invest some random Bitcoin. And I, after invested a bit, a little bit of Bitcoin, I, I, I begin to think about what we can do from, I mean, except for the FinTech. And also I'm a super fan for Elon Musk and I met my partner and we just thinking maybe we can do some, something to combine the blockchain with the renewable energy. And also we have, um, right now we have over 30 people from 10 different countries. We have people from India, Taiwan, Slovenia, Korea, Japan, and the United States and also have several people from Pakistan. So it's a very international team with diversified country, cultural. Yeah, that, that's our team. So, and next. And that's how you can learn from Animal Labs. You can get access to the Twitter, the Facebook, and our WeChat accounts. And by the way, so, uh, um, it's my first time. It's uh, our first time to represent our idea and solution to to Singapore people. So definitely, it's not. It, it will not be the last time. And uh, stay tuned with our official account, and you can get more information about our project. And uh, maybe we can meet again in Singapore. So, thank you. Let's give her a round of applause again. Yeah. So uh, later uh, we will um, later we will be Kundiak. So actually Kundiak is a crypto post. So 
is a point point of sales. So we are a very different ICO project, which might be you might be heard it for or not. So uh, we are hardware uh, ICO. So we do have our close device, and then we do have our cards. We do have our banking settlement systems, and what we want to achieve is to making uh, cryptocurrency as easy, accessible to everyone. So yeah, we will welcome Paco, our PR lady from Puniax, to give you the presentation. Paco. Thank you, uh, Danny. Um, and also thank you for you to uh, spending time with us. Uh, I guess uh, today is uh, very busy for everyone and everyone is tired listen to a lot of speeches. I want to be as strong as possible to introduce what we are doing. And before I begin, I would like to know how many of you have cryptocurrency? Would you like to raise your hand, please? Okay, that I actually got quite a lot. So I will pursue uh, about 30% of the crowd have a cryptocurrency um, in this group. But however, um, uh, actually, in the world, um, when we are talking of, about blockchain, cryptocurrency, it seems like oh, a lot of people rushing in this industry, rushing to having the Bitcoin, to having the uh, cryptocurrency. However, we found that there are less than 1% of the population have cryptocurrency. So why why is this happen? Like, okay, here we have a relatively um, knowledgeable crowd that know how to manage to get cryptocurrency. For example, myself, um, I start to have uh, cryptocurrency. I need to learn about um, the private key, the public address, whether my cryptocurrency, whether is it safe to store in somewhere, should I give it out my, pri my private keys, because we were war a lot like we shouldn't give out our private key but however there are so many people they don't know about it so there were there's a lot of issues like uh, they get hacked so uh, we are very concerned about these issues so how can we make the cryptocurrency as easy to use as possible and at the same time it's safe for the regular people that can manage to keep them okay so our mission is to make buying, selling, and also accepting cryptocurrency as easy as, as buying, a crypto, uh, buying a bottle of water. So now if you buy cryptocurrency, there are so many steps, right? Uh, you might need to register a wallet, you might need to choose an exchange, you might need to uh, go through the KYC first, and you might need to connect your uh, credit card to your um, to your uh, account, there's so many steps. So how can we make the steps easier for people um, to, so that the cryptocurrency usage can be widespread and can anyone can use it. So this is also our goal, to make blockchain-based transaction as easy as possible, as, as to go to a mainstream as, as many as possible. So we have to decide a, a a relatively easy uh, onboarding solution for the uh, mainstream. So here is our device. We want to uh, empower the, um, the store owner. Uh, for example, if you are a retail owner and uh, there are a lot of mainstream consumers, they will walk into the store and then they will uh, buy things from the store owner. We want to empower the store owner to have this kind of solution that, okay that they will be able to um, accept uh, cryptocurrency or uh, sell the cryptocurrency to their customer as easy as possible. So uh, that would be include a, uh, the, the terminal, POS terminal. I will explain that uh, later. The terminal itself can accept uh, all the blockchain-based uh, cryptocurrency. Now we have the Bitcoin, we have the Ethereum, we have our own coin and PSS. Uh, also, we have Quantum. We have uh, um, Lamb. We have also have uh, other cryptocurrency. So we open to the uh, uh, cryptocurrency uh, issuers to list on our device 
um, this is also part of our business model. And uh, we have the Kumi Express car. This car is actually uh, like a, a cold physical wallet. So people can use this uh, NFC enabled car to uh, store their cryptocurrency they buy from the, the store owner through the, our POS device. And also our POS device integrate the mobile payment. So um, PUNYS actually is the uh, QR code uh, payment. Uh, we are doing QR code payment in Indonesia. We are one of the um, leading QR code, offline QR code provider. And we have a Puni uh, Puni app, mobile app. People can use their, uh, like uh, Alipay, people just use uh, their app to pay at a store uh, through QR code. So um, our um, previous uh, business is also uh, doing the QR code payment. So we also interpret uh, the QR code payment in there. So people can use their either Alipay to conduct a uh, blockchain-based payment through our POS. And also we support a top up. So how, how does it work? Um, many people would think, okay, uh, you have this, uh, this uh, gadget, uh, also cars, how does it work? So uh, our solution is actually based on the Pundiax uh, platform. We have the plugin for um, all kinds of blockchain uh, provider uh, technology platform to plug into our platform. For example, if uh, uh, Ethereum is our public chain, and uh, we will use Ethereum as our public chain to conduct uh, transaction. Also, we have a private chain which uh, is, we are using the private chain on NAND network. So NAND uh, blockchains, we, we give us uh, faster um, transactions. So uh, based on this platform, um, is, if there's any transaction that would require critical speed, uh, which means that uh, we have to confirm this uh, transaction as soon as possible, and however Ethereum is uh, very slow or or gem, uh, jammy, and then we will convert it first on the then uh, private chain, and then we sync to the uh, public chain later. So here we have the uh, Pundex platform, and then on the top of it, we have the POS system that would connect to the platform, and uh, we also work with the exchange, uh, which provide us the rate uh, of the cryptocurrency um, um, uh, exchange, for example, how many uh, US dollar uh, in terms of what, uh, one Bitcoin. And we will uh, get the numbers from the uh, exchange that we collaborate with. And also the uh, token holder will have uh, either digital wallet to conduct transaction or they use the uh, Pony aspect card. So how does it work? Um, this is you. Um, Maybe I can uh, show you uh, on with our device. I don't think, uh, is there any one of you, before I do this demo, do you already know what Pundias is doing? Can you raise your hand? Okay, one. Okay, not many, right? So I will just demo how we can, um, <coughs> how we can conduct buy a Bitcoin as easy as possible. So this is our post machine. As you see, uh, there are a lot of coins listening there. And uh, I will use, for example, uh, I am the uh, store owner, you are the customer, and you want to buy a 0.1 uh, Bitcoin. And then I, as an owner, store owner, I, I click 0.1. And in this interface, we have Singapore dollar, and also we have the uh, Bitcoin uh, units. So you can choose either you buy 200 Singapore dollar of the Bitcoin, or you can choose to buy uh, 0.1 uh, Bitcoin. So let's assume you buy 0.1 Bitcoin. And then uh, here in this uh, screen, you will see uh, the live uh, exchange rate, which we fetch from the exchange. And if you accept, okay, uh, 
Bitcoin is 1,082 uh, Singapore dollar. And if you accept to pay this, that much of money, and then, um, and then you can press OK. And when you press OK, and there are there is a um, um, a certain time for your confirm. Uh, we set it up 120 seconds because the volatility of Bitcoin is quite uh, large. So we give a, a sh uh, the time frame. If you pass the time frame, if you're not confirming, and there will be a new rate for this. So it's actually reduced uh, the um, the risk of the um, owner to sell the Bitcoin. So it's uh, give you a certain time to confirm. If you say yes, that's okay. And then you choose, uh, we choose the top up uh, put it as the card. And then I have this card. And here is the, your receipt. So you, you buy the Bitcoin in your physical wallet, which is a Kundi Expect card, in the Kundi Expect card, and also you can see the detail of how much that you are buying. So it's very easy to use. For the um, store owner, they only need to know, um, um, provide the device, and for the customer, they only need to tap, like the, you buy, like you take MRT, you just top up on your card. And also we have our uh, new device coming up, which is uh, we, as you see our device, there's no uh, car readers. Uh, when we do the roadshow, we saw that uh, actually there are a lot of uh, countries, they use uh, the credit card uh, to cons consume the goods. And so we need to have the magnetic uh, stripe, and also we need to read the smart chip. So in this uh, new model, we have these two, uh, ready and also we support we have the Apple Pay ready we have the Samsung Pay ready as well so uh, this will be coming up in Q2 and for your information there are a lot of uh, uh, regulation standards in the uh, post industry and uh, to protect your uh, data because there are a lot of data uh, trend, uh, uh, transmit uh, to the post machine, a lot of sensitive data. We make sure that our post machine has uh, the highest security standards. So we pass uh, over 27 uh, industry standards to uh, make the security um, more stricter. For example, if you try to open our post device or you, if you try to in, uh, integrate something in our post device, actually it will trigger our uh, security alarm and it will release the sensitive data. So uh, we make sure that uh, the data has to be secure uh, when using this POS device. Next slide, please. So uh, to talk about our target market, uh, we plan to uh, launch our device, first of all, in Asia. Uh, we see there are demands in Korea, in Japan, and in Singapore. So we were uh, in, the, in Q2, we will start rolling out our device uh, to our business uh, pre-order uh, in Q2. Um, so we will do a lot of testing and also delivering uh, in Q starting from Q2. And then we will start to uh, ship uh, the device to also to Europe, European countries. We also got a lot of interest in European countries as well. Next slide, please. So um, I just quickly go through. Um, yeah, there are uh, some interesting partner that we have we uh, in China, they would like to distribute our post device uh, in Hong Kong and also in Taiwan. Uh, this is a listed company uh, in China. And next slide, please. And also we collaborate with the Korean uh, exchange, Coinest. Uh, we will uh, deliver over 300,000 aspect card to their customers uh, in Q2. And it's not easy to establish this uh, ecosystem because you have to collaborate with all kinds of uh, blockchain um, developers uh, in the industry and also government people and also um, uh, association. So we are very actively um, participate in this association to make sure that we comply with the regulation and, and the standards. 
next one. So uh, if you are interested in uh, learning more about our product, our solution, our project, please feel free to uh, join this uh, our social media channels, talk to us, and uh, we are very welcome to work with you. Thank you. So we developed, you know, the post device, so a hardware uh, crypto device to help people, you know, to really use the cryptocurrency to circulate, to utilize it. So Enigo is the one who actually use it, uh, utilize the clean energy with blockchain technology. And Quantum is a public chain with a, with a uh, layer of Bitcoin, but with a quick uh, Ethereum smart contract function, but right nowadays people are keep you keep asking me, uh, what kind of you know block, public chain should I use to build my own or uh, to generate my own tokens? So right now the default in industry is Ethereum, but there's some some feedbacks saying about Ethereum, the network of Ethereum keep congesting. You send some, you send, you send something to the other, the other parties, but it takes you two hours or even more to go through. So quantum, uh, the one of the latest and new uh, blockchain technology might help. So today we are more than happy to invite the senior developers of quantum to give us a brief introductions about how to the, the smart contract of quantum. So for. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for having me. It's my second time in Singapore and I love the food here, so I hope uh, I will soon be here for the third time. So I'll be talking about smart contract today. Uh, has anybody programmed a smart contract? So nobody here programmed a smart contract. Oh, there it is. Okay. Has anybody seen a smart contract? Okay, so a uh, few more people. Okay. So uh, today, I think uh, I'll introduce what smart contracts are. Uh, so uh, for now, smart contract on, on quantum and Ethereum is more or less the same. But in the future, quantum will have x86, so it's going to be different. And now, like the, the thing we talk, I talk, talk about, it's going to be it's going to apply to Ethereum as well, as well as quantum. All right. So my talk. I'm going to talk about why we need smart contract in the first place. So I think a lot of the time, uh, people when people talk about smart contract, it's just sort of kind of wavy or where is smart contract to solve this problem? But uh, uh, why do we actually want to use smart contract to solve this problem? And after and then I'll talk about what exactly are smart contract. So you will see you'll see what they look like. So you don't have to know coding. It's just like a basic idea of what smart contracts are. And so maybe when you found, when you form your own team, or maybe when you do due diligence of a project you want to invest, you have some idea of whether you are just bullshitting or not. Right. Okay, so why do we need smart contracts? Okay. Mining is extremely expensive. Either we're doing proof of stake or proof of work. Uh, proof of work is spending energy, and proof of stake is spending financial resources. So either way, it's going to cost a lot. So why do we even bother with a, a blockchain to run some proof of work? Test, test, testing one. Hello. Oh. Oh. Uh, uh, this one doesn't work. Oh, okay. So the root thing is really for social scalability. It's a way for people to collaborate, right? So at a very basic level, I as an individual, everything happens in my mind, so it's very efficient to work. But then, as we, as the work gets more complicated or the works get too much, I can't finish the work myself. I have to get other people involved. Then I get like friends I get, that I can trust. Right. Then after that, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have to build a community of, that involves more people that I don't know. So, is a as the task get more complicated, we need to get more people involved. And we need to have a way to collaborate, either through contracts or other mechanisms. So, so, um, so the way, so, so, uh, to, 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 
to collaborate, we need we really need to have a way to, to minimize the trust we need to have. So at a very basic level, I, I trust myself so I can just work with myself, right? And I have friends I can trust, so I don't need I don't really need to sign any contract with my friends. But if I get like a company then to work with all these people, then I start to need to have mechanisms so that I, I don't even know them. So I have to I sign something and make sure that we don't cheat each other. So that's a, a way to, to minimize the, the need for trust. Right. So so these mechanisms like contracts or laws or the police, these things are really technology. So uh, I, I can trust somebody or I can use the law to say, okay, we'll just obey the same thing. Right. And at a, at a human level, we'll have a relationship, but then as the the group of collaboration grows, we have market. So we're not really talking about relationship anymore. We're just talking about pricing mechanism, and we'll use price to uh, allocate resources. Uh, we'll go from like point to point. Like if I, I at a small scale, it's just me knowing somebody, then we just work together or we exchange something. Then at a bigger scale, we have many to many collaboration, and this is what uh, social technologies are. Uh, so these social technologies are not cheap. Right? You sign a contract, it's a piece of paper. But this piece of paper is enforced by police, and it's, uh, and it's also has all these like law laws behind it, right? all this history of case laws. Behind it. So it's actually very expensive, even though you don't, you don't see it. Uh, so like, in OECD countries, uh, the percentage of GDP spending is 36 to 38 percent. So if you consider all that, it's not, it's not cheap at all. So, um, so blockchain is really a way to use silicon to replace carbon. So uh, all of us are part of the consensus mechanism in the real world. But in blockchain, we're really using computation to replace the consensus that's, that, that's necessary. OK, so that's the why we, we want to have trust. And we want to have a way to collaborate. And we're using machines to, to replace like, humans in, in forming consensus and in forming rules and enforcing rules. Uh, so smart contract is a, is a manifestation of that. So the, the, the closest uh, uh, metaphor I can think, think, think of for a smart contract is the Amazon Lambda service. So does anybody know what Lambda is? Uh, oh, cool, wow, great. <laughs> okay. so, so what's so cool about Lambda is you don't have to manage your server, you don't have to, you don't have to own anything. You just write some business logic. You write some code, and you upload the code to Lambda. And when somebody needs to run it, it just runs itself. So you don't have to manage it. So it's like, you write your business lo logic, then you just forget about it. And as soon as somebody needs it, it just, it just runs itself. It's very convenient. All right, so, so a smart con contract is essentially a small piece of uh, business logic. Uh, you don't need to do anything with it. Just, you just, you just write a business logic. You just put it on blockchain, and if somebody needs it, they run it, and that's it. You don't have to run servers, you don't have to run anything. You can just forget about it. And there's no, if something goes goes wrong with it, like there's, there's really, uh, it's, the server never, never goes down, so it's, it's great. So here's a very simple example, and it captures the basic of a smart contract. Uh, it's a simple counter, and it has a, it has a business logic. So here's the, the increment function. So what it does is it increments uh, a number. So a, 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 a smart contract has a state. It, it remembers something. And it also has a, has a way to change the state. So that's essentially what it is. And you put it on the blockchain. Uh, yeah. So we'll see the next example. Uh, okay. yes. All right. All right. So we're, we're going to see a, a, um, a fuller example that captures what's so sexy and what's so cool about blockchain. So here's what I'm gonna talk about, like donation chain. Right? So, so uh, you receive donations from people, and when, if, you spend the thing, do, if you spend the donation, you're gonna have to write down the purpose, like why you're withdrawing your, your donation. Um, what's so cool about this is, like, if you have your own PHP stuff, or you, if you have your own server, nobody's gonna trust you. Like, maybe you just make random changes in your database and nobody knows. Right? But here, like in, in donation chain, I put it on the blockchain. So it's open to everybody, and everybody can be sure that there's no way for you to cheat. 
Uh, so here are some features we need to do. Uh, at the very beginning, to initialize this project, we're gonna have to set the administrator. Uh, only the administrator can can withdraw money, and anyone can donate. Anyone can donate. And only the admin can take money from from the contract. All right, so here's the source code. It's about like 20, 20 lines of code. It's, it's not, not much at all. But behind this, it's, like, it's exactly the same as signing, signing a contract, right? Because the contract is, a, a, a contract is essentially a piece of paper. But, but behind it is like a whole edifice of government and bureaucracy to enforce the contract. It's the same as this, like, the, 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 donation, the donation chain itself is very simple. But behind it is the whole edifice of blockchain mining and the whole ecosystem that supports this. All right, so the very first part is setting the, administ uh, the administrator of, of this contract. So when you create a contract, you run a, a very little piece of code here, right? And there's a, <laughs> uh, so here's a, a state that remember, remembers who the owner is. So when you, when, when you create a contract, you want to set the owner of the contract. So that's essentially what this is doing. All right, uh, anyone can donate. So the code itself is very, is very, very simple. But there's more, more things involved here. Uh, essentially, you create a transaction that sends some value, either quantum or ether, into the contract. Uh, in, the, in the donate, in the business logic here, it checks whether the transaction you create has satisfied certain conditions. So here the condition is the, the minimum amount of donation, 0 0.001 ether. So that's the, well, you, can, you, can, you can specify whatever condition you want, but here the condition is very simple. Uh, so when you send money into the contract, the contract goes into the, the, uh, the, the, the money goes into the contract's balance. So a contract is also uh, like a bank account. All right, so here the here, here's the last part of our our uh, example. Here's a withdraw function. Uh, so here it takes a, a couple of options. You can specify where to withdraw to. Right? So maybe some 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 uh, some organiz organization needs the money to build a school or to build a hospital. Uh, here's the amount to withdraw, and here's the the purpose. Right? So here. There's also this line of code that checks whether the person doing the withdrawal is the owner. So the owner is set in the very, in the very beginning when we create a contract. And here we transfer the, 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 money, the money to the address as a target recipient. And here we admit a log entry of how much was, how much was withdrawal and what amount and for what purpose. So here's. Just some basic business logic and explain it in English. But here we use Solidity to encode the, the rules and the logic behind it, and also like, to make some audit, auditable record. All right, so that, that, that completes our example. Uh, um, so some, some, some characteristics of EVM, which is the, the platform of uh, Ethereum, which is also the, the platform for quantum. Uh, Quantum will have a different virtual machine in the future, but here we'll, 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 we'll be using EDM as well. Uh, yeah, so users pay for computation. So usually in a typical web application, uh, the company just buys some server and, and everybody can use it for free. But in, in the smart contract world, it's very different. People pay for the computation. Uh, users, they have authority. Right? So if you use a bank, you use a bank card, you go to the ATM machine, uh, or you use your credit card, the authorization belongs to the credit card company. They can deny your transaction or they can accept your transaction. But here, uh, the authority is on, on users, on users' hands. Uh, they can, they, if a user sign uh, a transaction, sign, sign a check, then that check is accepted by, by anyone. And most importantly, why the why a smart contract is so expensive and why the app is so slow and expensive is because all the computation and data is recomputed on every single node. So even though it's like hundreds of thousands of nodes, well not hundreds of thousands, but thousands of nodes, tens of thousands of nodes, uh, these are not uh, these nodes. They don't increase the computation capacity 
for the whole network. That was essentially a one, one machine. All right, so some shortcomings are slow and expensive, and the transaction cycle is very complicated. It's complex, uh, so it's harder to build applications for. Uh, there's no networking, so there's no way to like, get external data onto the blockchain, and you cannot update the, the code. So you have, if you have bugs or, or vulnerabilities, security, security holes, there's no way for you to, you know, to, to fix, fix your thing. So do you really need decentralization? And that's a central question that uh, all, all builders should ask themselves. All right. All right, so here's our open source project. So if you're interested, you can, you can go on GitHub and look at it. All right. that's it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Howard. So, yeah, uh, I guess everyone is hungry right now, so I don't want to, you know, I'm the only one who, you know, stop us between food and food. Yeah. So, yeah, so we will have a rest for 15 minutes, so after that, uh, we'll have a round table discussion with Quantum, uh, Enigo, uh, Pundiax, and uh, CG, uh, Pluto Granite. So, yeah, see you guys later.
Right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so we will start our round table session in five minutes, so three. So please get back to your seat, please. And you know, we don't mind do you have your food, drinks with you. So, yeah.
So guys, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please come in to sit. We're going to start the round table panel discussion. Okay, uh, welcome everybody, welcome back. So, uh, okay, uh, okay, so guys, uh, my name is Ryan, uh, I'm also the founder of uh, Crypto Grinders. Today we'll be covering uh, the, the, four, the, the, three, the, the three projects here, Venergo, Quantum, and Prometex. So I think the most important, uh, this is one of the most important segments as well, because we want everyone to participate in this segment because we want people to understand more about blockchain, right? And if you are an existing business that is wanting to adopt blockchain, um, I think these are th these are the right people to ask, right? Because as you can see just now in terms of uh, Howard's presentation with smart contracts, um, it, it is the space that is really developing right now. So there are a lot of opportunities, potentials, and risks involved. So right now, especially if you are wondering, okay, as an investor, what is it? What is the what is the landscape like? As someone who is developing in the space, what are the risks involved? And last but not least, I think what are the potential growth uh, that we can see in the next three to five years in the space? So without further ado, uh, maybe we can start uh, with a few questions. So, um, so from the panel, right? Uh, in no particular order, but maybe we start with Danny first. Okay, Danny, maybe when you first started out, uh, you, you understand that uh, you started with uh, Pundi Pundi at first. Yes. Okay, you're an entrepreneur with uh, Pundi Pundi. You started off with the payment payment channels uh, with Pundi Pundi. What made you decide to build on the blockchain uh, rather than just stick to the conventional, traditional way of building a, uh, a pet payment channel? Okay, so basically, um, the actual building of Pundi Pundi actually is like an uh, early pay alike, but it's a diminishing version. So we built that because we saw um, that's um, 
I know thirty percent if I if I remember correctly. So in Indonesia, there's only thirty percent of the population has credit card, and then that's right, uh, has bank account. So and then only five percent of the total population has credit card. So you can imagine they need to bring their cash. I I mean, as seriously, I, I they they actually bought this big of the bag you know, with the cash to go to go to furniture shops to buy the bag. It's crazy. Yes, they uh, usually uh, Indonesians are extremely. Uh, Cash rich, <laughs> so, yeah, so they need the help. Yeah, so uh, so that's why we built the the Pundi Pundi, which is you know to help us to use their mobile apps, pay, just like uh, China with the WeChat Pay. So what I mean, the the, the business went well because the, the market is growing, but we actually face a problem is that um the merchant and the banks and the banks actually they don't trust us. Because they said you are small, you are new, so they don't know who you are. So that's why we need some something is trustless platform. So say that if I send you money, you really get it. So that's how we actually try to go through the blockchain technology. But when we go through technology, uh, Indonesian people has this problem. They are skeptical about new things. They don't know what it really is, and that is too difficult for them to understand what is blockchain, what is Bitcoin. So that's why we developed this big bulky uh, POS device to, to which and can actually print out a, a receipt, you know, which is actually not necessary in blockchain. So just to let them understand what is blockchain, what is a trusted plat platform, not only for the people but for the banking and system as well. well then, Will there be any efforts? Will there be any efforts made um, in from Indonesia's side to educate the public with regards to this? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, basically, Indonesia the the illiteracy, the the education's uh, level actually is uh, not very high. So most of them actually only secondary high school or graduated or uh, you know primary school. So they most of them actually work overseas. So, um, so in this case, uh, we actually built this device. I mean, we believe that if they can really understand that, uh, most of the populations of the people outside uh, Southeast Asia or even other countries can really understand what it is. So, we believe that the signature part will be the education. I mean, the mass adoptions. If they can really know what is it, then we can really, uh, you know, uh, expand to the other network. Yeah. So, thank you so much, Danny. Okay, so now the next we will have Stella. We will have Stella. Uh, Stella is uh, from Quantum. Uh, and Quantum has, uh, in, in a nutshell, it's a smart contract protocol, right? So uh, Stella, maybe you can share with us uh, what it means to actually achieve scalability and how you, how you, how you plan to achieve the scalability uh, on a global scale with Quantum. Test, test. So actually I'm in how PR and marketing at Quantum so and regarding like I my for past days like because of with Doc here. So I would love to let him to explain more tech part about our you know the scalability about quantum. So Okay, um, so scalability is to maybe to highlight, there's also a marketing aspect aspect about scalability, which is of course to allow people to know. But there's also a technical aspect. So maybe Howard can share first. Then after that, it will go to Stella. Okay. Uh, so for scalability, is is an open question that everybody is talking about it. But uh, I think there's always a trade-off between scalability and uh, decentralization. So it really depends on how much decentralization is enough. Uh, whether it's like 20, 20 nodes inside map, or is it five nodes inside map, or is it uh, so around five nodes is like PFT, uh, five nodes <coughs> for the volumes, and it has higher TPS, uh, maybe like 100 TPS per second. And uh, for deep pause, it's probably like 20 nodes. And uh, the TPS, the potential TPS would be limited on like one machine, so that would be maybe like 4,000 TPS per second. And then there's a POS, which is like our consensus mechanism, and the TPS is uh, 40 or something, 40 or 60. Uh, so it's on a spectrum, like this is decentralization, where do you want to be? 
and where is your uh, what are your useful programs? Like, do you need that instrumentation? And when do you need it? You don't need it all the time, probably. Maybe you're an exchange, and most of your trades are just happening on your platform. That's not a problem. The only way to settle is settle on, on, on the chain. So it's also like where do you want that scale to be? So I feel a lot of time we're just constantly talking about as much TPS as possible. But as much TPS as possible, but we're also talking about uh, this uh, re recentralization. So I think you know, we should also talk more about the cost of uh, that's scary. <laughs> so I think it's not an easy answer to, to, to answer. It. There's always, always a trade-off involved. And I think people who just focus on uh, scalability is probably also missing the point of the whole blockchain <laughs> enterprise. So uh, we got to this part, yeah. And so actually, uh, <coughs> with regards to uh, okay, so for maybe for those who couldn't really hear the hard word, uh, with regards to I think from a technical standpoint, it's always a little bit more challenging. There's always a trade-off between uh, speed and also security, right? When it comes down to scalability, centralization. Yes. Okay, centralization, and then after that, there's also uh, speed. When you're more central, you get speed. But at the same time, you're sacrificing the security as well. Uh, is that correct, Howard? In that way, you put it on. Security is also a very broad term, like a centralized platform. <laughs> Hello? Uh, yeah, a centralized platform can also be secure. So I think it's more about trust. Like whether you trust what, or do you maybe trust a, a, a confederation of banks, or maybe you trust like, just normal people like us. You know, P P2P network such as Bitcoin. So that's different degrees of uh, decentralization. Like you're either, either trusting hundreds of people, or maybe thousands of people, or maybe just a handful of people. Right. So in the case of a handful of people, you're probably more talking about that you need more regulations. In, in which case, right? So you need like for banks, you need government regulation and to guarantee the, their uh, to guarantee their behavior. You know, cheap. But if you go to like hundreds of nodes, then everybody obeys the same mechanism. Then in that case, you don't really need the trust as much. So actually, as you know, I contact a smart contract platform. So we uh, definitely like encourage more. <laughs> difficulties guys just like so, yeah so um we to really encourage more and more developers like uh, from the community can just like build their you know great ideas to so just start their business on quantum so the first thing like um, we're trying to uh, cooperate with some like universities in, in China or all the world uh, we have already cooperated with uh, TTU from Estonia so we have uh, like a give a really like uh, the master topic. So all the masters they they just trying to start start the quantum and doing some research paper about the quantum. So and the other thing is that we also cooperate with the uh, you know uh, one university in China is like Jiao Tong Xi'an uh, University. So we uh, we start a, a blockchain labs there. So trying to give more ideas about the students. I mean like uh, all the like kind of logics and math and uh, the com com computer science like major students. So, so, uh, so yeah. So they just trying to give them more idea about like uh, what's blockchain actually. So uh, the other things like uh, we also doing some like uh, events. We cooperate with some like uh, you know uh, really like. Uh, blockchain institutions about uh, you know to educate people to doing some like a tour tour events so uh, actually so uh, in around July we're trying to do some like Euro tour about to but we more focus on the developer community so we're trying to give them more ideas about you know like uh, blockchain as well so yeah I just I just forgot I, I need to mention one thing like we have uh, you know workshop with like SUSS uh, this 
Monday and Tuesday. So uh, we got several of our like, uh, senior developers here to kind of uh, give you ideas about how to uh, do quantum programming. And well, the second size, I kept, uh, we are actually quantum doing the uh, quantum enterprise region. So version, sorry. So we trying to uh, actually also talking with some like big enterprise, trying to really uh, get quantum ideas can get used to and you know suitable for the uh, commercial commercial using case use case. So yeah, this is kind of what we are doing, and from quantum like kind of marketing the four like the the main like ideas right now. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, what I'm hearing is that I think most projects would also still like to include uh, the commercial or enterprise aspect But at the same time, they do not want to uh, forget about the public which uh, because open source uh, Platforms tend to allow creativity and lots of ideas especially right now as you can see It's a lot on the development side and the tech so maybe we could uh, have a little bit on uh, KK's side on how for, for her, she basically thought about building a Nurgle on Quantum. So maybe KK, you could share with us, uh, like what has it been like in terms of uh, your journey previously, uh, and then how did you come to the blockchain space, and what were the challenges that you faced um, as an entrepreneur and a co-founder of this current uh, Bernagol Labs? So this work right, okay. Um, first, my my journey. Uh, to blockchain is just because uh, I think around 2010, I some friends in the United States, they, they suggest uh, I, I could invest in some in Bitcoin and uh, the folks, so I just did it. And as a return, I do have some investment back, but uh, at that time I'm thinking, but uh, except for investor cryptocurrency, how we can do something to bring the value of the blockchain to the to the daily lives because uh, as a user we have to think about it do you think the users they care about whether it's a blockchain or wrong chain any chain i don't think they care right if uh, my parents want they want to pay the electricity bill if they want to take a breath if they want to do anything on the application they only think if the application is easy to use and whether it's safe and whether it can save their money they don't care about the the, the I mean the back end of the, this technology so uh, so that's why at first I'm thinking about uh, let's do something for the users to fix some problems and uh, I think uh, it's just a chance so so why build on the blockchain then what <laughs> why why bother to build on the blockchain couldn't you just use um, a central server AWS and, and that is really yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, so I will explain a little bit about why we bring the blockchain renewable energy sector because. As I have mentioned, the, the biggest the challenge and the problem for the renewable energy is renewable energy, especially for the wind and solar, it can be funded anywhere. So big corporate, they cannot control everywhere. So that's how a future decentralized energy community is like. And by uh, this is a physical decentralized uh, structure in the physical world. But so in that way, we need a decentralized software to integrate with the hardware to build a real zero marginal cost of society in the futures. So by using the blockchain, the IoT, the telecommunication, I think definitely in the future we can build a trust economy. So what is the trust economy? I think that's the sharing economy. So we don't need a centralized authority to determine what value you have bring to the community or to the network. So I think that's the value of the blockchain in this uh, in our solution. I don't think peer to peer is a is the is a key word. I think the key word should be the autonomous. So um, and also I think there's a lot of challenges. So first is the tech challenges for the security, the scalability, and also one question is the cost. I think because for the users, if they using your the application. They have some usage, they have their transaction, but in blockchain world, you sometimes you have to pay ether, you have to pay quantum as a, right? So there is the extra cost for the user. So definitely as a, I mean, if you want to have the ICO, if you want to have some projects based on blockchain, you have to think about what the value for your pro, uh, from your product to the users. If the user, they're using the, the app, but they have to pay the extra cost. So why they have to use it? 
So yeah, so I think you have to definitely think about the value the blockchain can bring to your product and uh, what kind of problems you want to fix. And uh, get back to our project, I think the biggest challenge is uh, the age discrimination. So because uh, most of people from energy sector, they, they are over 50, they have over 60 years, uh, I mean 30 years experience in energy sector. So I, I always been asked, as how old are you? Because they think I'm too young to, to get involved in the energy sector. So that's the first So question. do you think that you're a threat, or they think that you're a threat to the industry, just like banking? Um, I mean, in the banking sector, um, blockchain is actually a threat to the whole uh, legacy financial system. So do you think that the energy, the, the, you know, people who are in energy currently may find it as a threat to the, the existing ecosystem, or do they feel that, that the blockchain uh, you build, building on the blockchain would actually complement or actually supplement their existing business? I think uh, it depends. So first, uh, if we don't have a lot of the education, they will think maybe we are another competitor who wants to grab their money from their pockets. But definitely, I think, uh, so yesterday we, we were at the panel in the SUSS. So I've, I'm very interested about the, the concept of how to bring the inclusive blockchain value to the users. So first is the education. You, you have to help more and more people, like 80% of the public, they have to understand the value of the blockchain. So otherwise, like even if, oh, every time we are talking about we're doing the blockchain, we are very cool, but I mean, we cannot get the consensus from the public world. And so I think right now, most of the people from energy sector, they think we are the competitor, the biggest competitor. So when it comes to the re innovation in blockchain, they are very hesitant, and a lot of them, they are very rejected. And, I mean, but uh, after education, definitely, I think, it's just like 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we don't have the mobile payment, we only have the banking system. But right now, even in China, I don't need to bring the cash. I, I always use the Alipay, WeChat Pay, or we can use the Grab Pay, uh, I mean, every pay. So, but there is always a banking system. So what we do is, we want to encourage more renewable energy consumption in the world to, to develop the sustainable environment. We don't want to, oh, I want to grasp, uh, I want to grasp your business. It's not our vision to do that. Okay, so um, with regards to that, right, um, I think the most important thing about blockchain space is also uh, the adoption rate. So I think adoption rate is very, very important. So right now, right, uh, let me be, maybe go back to Danny. So initially, uh, now that you have really successfully uh, raised your ICO, um, what are your plans in, uh, apart from education, what are, what's the kind of projected adoption rate that you see for your POS systems and um, also, in terms of the challenges that you'll face, right? Because it's not, I mean, it's not as straightforward, right? So maybe you can share a little bit about the plan for deployment and all that. Yeah, sure. So, um, like the statistics says, um, there's only 1% of the whole, the whole world population has a uh, cryptocurrency. And then, um, even probably, I don't know, 20% or 30% of people have been heard about, um, you know, cryptocurrency because of the, the, the price skyrocket of that and then some 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 youngster like us you know make a lot of money which is not true of course so and then some of my friends from banking so who has struggled six months at least to get his first bitcoin I don't know whether he got his first bitcoin or not so uh yeah so that's a uh, problem so everyone knows about bitcoin but they don't know how to you know buy it because the private key you know 60 digits who gonna you know really memorize it and then even if you memorize it somehow you know you will get hacked by you know in your Evernote system does, does anyone have bitcoin here like honestly uh, maybe a show of hands who actually owns bitcoin okay not too bad not too bad better response from last time <laughs> yeah yeah that's good yeah. that's good got you <laughs> yeah yeah that's good man uh but you know don't store your bitcoin in Evernote yeah <laughs> okay. So yeah, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, so back to the mass adoption part. What should we do? Um, yeah, so our our point is to you know really making the the post device is to making the currency as easy as possible, like accessible to everyone. So it's just easy like in using your 
debit card, your credit card, you know, just tap it, like an MRT card, just tap it, then you can spend, you can buy, do whatever. So, so the, the challenge remains. It's so that simple, you know, uh, just like the credit card, debit card, but the governor, the regulator will come in to look at you. Why on, what on earth do I need a new payment method? So this is the first question they will ask. Secondly, they will ask, are you secure or not? Then thirdly, who's going to benefit from it? So to answer the first questions, if you need, uh, what's, what's the differences between the fiat money and cryptocurrency? I mean, I don't want to really to stress about the, you know, the benefits of cryptocurrency. It's just, you know, the trusted platform, or, you know, the zero transaction fee, not zero transaction fee, almost low transaction fee, you know, low MDR, you know, everything. So, um, we, we can see, we actually see the benefits, the good parts of blockchain, so that, that's why we are here. So we actually see the, the usage, the utility of token, that's why we are building the polls to improve it, to expand the network. So secondly, that comes to a question, whether it's secure or not. So everyone knows everything actually is recorded in blockchain, so it's pretty secure. But what is not secure is inside their mentality. Because they are not they don't really understand about what's really going on. Although everything is on the you know, you, you open the ether scan, everything is on it. You, everything is on it, but it's just something they couldn't control. So they are afraid of security. So the, the fear inside is they couldn't control. So in this case, uh the, there's there's another you know another another segment that came out. So that's why they need regulations. The regulations is good is because you can ease regulators' fear about using blockchain. So this is what we're actually doing uh, at the moment. And then of course quantum um and go will actually try to do that. So the third question will be who gonna benefit from it? So the regulators I, I, I don't know what the regulators is really thinking about, but um, we are actually disrupting the banks, uh, especially those payment gateway business. So they were thinking we are actually taking out their money, which actually is not at all. Because what we the, the people we are serving are those people who don't have a uh, bank account, credit cards. They don't even have their I identity, national identity. So if you are talking about this, then I believe we are actually serving their business of the their benefit the most in the case. So back to uh, the long, 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 long illustrations like that. Um, the biggest challenge actually is the fear. Like, because they couldn't control. Because the public doesn't know whether they can control it or not. Although, you know, in the current banking systems, we don't really control anything. But it's just something in the deep in the mind. We, we, we have the, the mirage in the inside for so long. So, yeah, it's not easy. And then, um, you know, we go through the merchants and we do this and that. So, uh, but so far so good, I would say. So we will start to plan, we will plan to um, deploy our device uh, from Tokyo, uh, Seoul, Singapore, Philippines, uh, Hong Kong, and uh, hopefully we can have our device from Lithuania and Switzerland do it as well. Uh, so you guys, I don't know, probably uh, you guys will see uh, our, our latest poll device which got the certifications, uh, you know, all the tax, all the testing, uh, in Singapore, I believe, uh, end of Q2. Yeah. All right. So um, you did highlight something with regards to regulation. So maybe we start with Stella, right? Because Stella is, uh, of course, we, you guys are situated in Shanghai. So how is the regulation at this current point with regards to cryptocurrencies, blockchain, and you know, the whole ICO scene? I mean, uh, because we, we, we may read things that are you know, a little bit more uh, scary in terms of like how China perceives cryptocurrencies, but in actual fact, what is the scene like? So maybe perhaps both <laughs> of, of you guys, uh, I mean the three of you being all situated in Shanghai uh, or Beijing, right? maybe you all can help us out to understand this space from a regulation standpoint. What is the word on the street? So actually, uh, cause like the you, you see like the price is going really crazy last last year, right? So uh, you will see like more and more projects like they just like maybe they don't really have a specific idea like about why they are gonna do their business on blockchain. So uh, I think they more focus on the token part as we say like because like you know maybe it's easier to make money. Yeah, right. So uh, I think. 
the government is trying to, you know, protect the, all the bad, you know, the the interest or their money from the individual investors because, like, there's a problem. It's like you might don't have a really, uh, you know, channels like to have the really like to know more about the details about each project. So that's a one thing. So I think uh, what we gonna trying to do is like make the you know uh, you know all the information more public. And we got trying to, uh, you know, maybe the government can be the, you know, uh, guardian to, you know, to to confirm and certificate whether all the information that project show up is really true or not. So I think after the regulation uh, up, uh, in in September last year, so I think the I mean all the changes like may become more and more like proper and actually. The government still encourage about the blockchain technology because, like, we need to, uh, you know, uh, I mean, like, it's really good project. Uh, I mean, good technology. So you're gonna, we're trying to like make it really everyone can get, you know, like, uh, you know, benefit from the technology. So yeah, so that's kind of thing about uh, you know the regulation in China. So uh, I, I mean, it's for people, it's like. You might have a more like a, you know proper and uh, safe way if you're gonna really invest in any project you know ICOs yeah so that's kind of the opinion maybe um, yeah I think uh, is forget about the price the token price think about like every project they just a new idea um, like maybe just like several months ago. So compared to a traditional startup, what's the difference? I think there is no difference. Just because they're using the blockchain, so we can we can convince ourselves they, they will they will be definitely successful in two years. Uh, in two years, I think no, it's not the right uh, It's not the right answer. So I think uh, um, different country they have different regulation and policy. I think. But that's what I heard. I have experiences in Singapore. In Singapore, so if in the places where you can have a well organized and uh, it's in a uh, good order, then you can know the space that you can have the freedom to to explore. If there is no order in this space, definitely I think there are a lot of problems in the future will occur. It's just like when the problem will goes up to the public. So I definitely think I definitely support all the regulations, but I do suggest I do suggest that we need like every project. Uh, I mean, we need more healthy regulation. It's not we ban everything or we have all the um, sensitive things. But I think a, a healthy regulation is very helpful to build the whole ecosystem in blockchain. And also every project you have to stick on to your own business. Yeah, so even the price goes up or goes down. I think uh, in a long term, people will, uh, if you can be successful, definitely is your business is a business. It's not idea. It's not a charity. It's not like I do some KOC project. That's enough. So that's my personal suggestion. Um, so my opinion on this issue is, uh, I think the technology is evolving very, very fast. So it's hard to come up with regulation that today, and that still applies in 10 years. So I think uh, existing laws probably work already, like security law, like most tokens are probably securities, and they should be prosecuted as such. <laughs> or they should enforce as such, sorry, not prosecuted as such, enforced as such. Uh, and some, the most egregious, like scammers, they should be just prosecuted as, as frauds. Financial plots. So I think existing laws, they are pretty good. They can probably handle most of the stuff that's going on in the crypto space. And as, as far as technology goes, I think like it's just going too fast. And my review, I think, of today is going to be different in five years or maybe even three years. So do you, so so just to just to uh, hit on your point, um, do you think that I mean anyone can jump in? Uh, in terms of regulation, right? Do you feel that apart from the government, is there a body that within the blockchain space that you guys can come together to kind of uh, 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 help to um, validate or at least validate projects and also uh, provide some oversight with, for projects 
uh, who are raising ICOs and at the same time also uh, investors who are coming in. And I mean, this is something that, you know, the public does not always know, right? Yeah. Right now, they're getting a lot of information from YouTubers. So, um, the, the problem with that is that the YouTubers are clueless themselves. In fact, the best people are the people that are sitting here. Right? Because they are the ones that build the credibility, they are the ones that have already have a reputation in the space. So governments are actually pretty much trying to understand the, the space, but they're still very far away from where they are. So it's like, uh, I, I, I kind of find that there should be kind of a, like a collaboration. Do you feel that that is something that uh, could be done as well with regards to that? Uh, For self, oversight, it's self, like oversight. Self-regulation. Self-regulation. Uh, but also, uh, it, it is more, not just self-regulation, but more of to provide um, a layer of protection also. Because you guys are the ones that understand the code. Whether or not a project is legitimate or not, I would not know, right? For all you know, let's say if I go to the GitHub, it, this guy is just changing the title over and over again. You see, he's not actually building anything. You see, I wouldn't know that. So I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, as, a, as a person who does tech, um, is there ways for us to spot such things? I mean, I'm just curious myself. I know, like, personally, like, I see a lot of projects out there, I think they're just scams. Uh, why? Uh, why? Uh, you find that? Just like, the why here is just full of bullshit, you know, like, telling about jargons and it just doesn't make any sense, like, in, in terms of tech. But they still manage to, like, raise lots of money. So, so I think it's hard, like, just to self-regulate. Like, people are just gonna, scammers are gonna be scammers. Uh, so I think, like, it's going, going to be more separation of power, like check and balances, right? So like, the other scammers, they should just go to jail. And like, in five years, like, people going bankrupt and people going to jails, it's going to clean up. So I, I, that's what I think. <laughs> Hardcore. Um, basically, I think you guys have read about Centra. Centra, recently the founders uh, were caught because of fraud, right? And Centra was one of the one of the biggest or most popular because May, uh, Floyd Mayweather and uh, DJ Khaled were kind of the face. I mean, they are not scammers, right? They're just the marketing aspect. But I'm just saying that it happens, and I think they raised, I think, 30 million or, or more with regards to this uh, crypto debit card. So, um, with regards to that, I think uh, uh, all this whole panel, uh, I think you all have questions. If you all have questions, please feel free to ask and we'll pass over the mic. Because I think the most important is that you guys get the maximum value from this panel because they are already successful in what they do. And uh, yeah, please feel free to ask uh, questions if you all have any, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll continue from there. Uh, any questions that you all like to ask, feel free to raise your hand, yeah, then I'll pass the mic. Uh, regarding Energo, can I ask like, how does the, uh, how do you help third world countries with no infrastructure with your blockchain? I guess then uh, the, the chair makes me uncomfortable. So, uh, I think uh, the first is we uh, partner with the local uh, microgrid operators, so they can provide the infrastructure and we can provide our software or the blockchain enabled soft software and the um, smart meter. And in that way, uh, the infrastructure, they will provide the physical layer. And the, our solution will provide the uh, um, digital layer to our solution. And uh, in, in that way, people in remote areas, first, they can get the electricity by the solar energy. And while, while they, if they have the access to renewable energy, they can get trade and they can have extra money. While they can get extra money and uh, electricity, there are more things they can do. They can have a better healthcare, they can have a better education, and even, I mean, maybe it's very little thing for all the people here, but I think it's a very big thing for people who don't have the electricity right now in the world. So, uh, any other questions? Ah, okay. Uh, hello. Uh, I have a very uh, mundane question for Quantum. Uh, uh, regarding parks in uh, s smart contract and things like that, do you build such ch chain? Yeah, so Quantum is uh, like... Uh, and also, like, uh, when do you decide to do this or don't do that? And uh, also about, uh, do you conduct, like, uh, penetration tests? So we have a colleague in Sweden that whose specialization is in decentralized system, and his job is just to write Python scripts and test quantum to death. Yeah, so we, we do penetration test. Yeah, and, um, and actually, we also have the the, the part company 
they are like quite good at you know like the security testing, trying to help not just only quantum. So we uh, cooperate with them. They're gonna provide some you know service for this, and also check you know also help the quantum devs to kind of check the you know deploying bugs or not. Yeah. I provide the service, incidentally. Incidentally? Incidentally. Oh, yeah, oh. yeah I deal with blockchain threats. Oh, yeah, okay. penetration. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, so, uh, wow, that was, a, that was a technical question. <laughs> very, very good question. Bit that, but very good question, by the way. Okay, so, um, <laughs> with regards to, okay, so any other further questions with regards to business development, Security. Uh, yeah. So uh, as you can see, because of all the technical difficulties, we are still very early. Uh, I'm not asking about technical, but I have a question for Pundi. Uh, I'm Indonesian myself, so I'm wondering, the government has already said that uh, cryptocurrency is illegal to be a form of transaction. So how is your KOS system gonna work in the in the Indonesia community? Yeah. So uh, very good question. So this of oh, Indonesia. Yeah. 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 So yeah, this lady. Yeah. So uh, as a this is um I believe is last year November or August. I think it's November or October. I forgot already. So the Bayi, which is the bank in Indonesia, they, they issue a uh, uh, this it's kind of like notice. I would say uh, in Indonesia, there's only one <coughs> currency you can use, which is rupiah. So which means that if you want to take uh, uh, you know US dollar, uh, Bitcoin, or in Malaysia ringgit or Singapore dollars, you cannot be traded in uh, within Indonesia. So that actually means that. Um, other than rupiah, you cannot do anything. So, uh, back to our host device. So, our host device has two functions, basically. So, firstly, is to accept cryptocurrency as the payment method. Secondly, is the buy-sell cryptocurrency. So, you are right, in Indonesia, we won't open that first feature. We only open the second part, which is the buy-sell cryptocurrency. So, we allow people to you know, buy the cryptocurrency for their own purposes like investment, the utility or some end and some. So that's the questions I think that's the answer so I don't know whether it's in Singapore. Okay, so that's uh did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, with regards to uh, uh, with regards to uh, the adoption regulation, so um, the next question I want to ask is uh, cost. Let's say if I was a business and I was to be building on uh, quantum for example um, I know it's I know it's a very tough question to ask, uh, but with regards to that, how much would it cost uh, a, a company to start running running their business on on quantum? Actually, uh, it, because like we we would quantum is a non profit foundation, and we are open source. So if you are gonna use our technology, it's like everything just for free. But the thing is like. You might need the money to, you know, build your team, you know, to, de de you know, develop your this business, and you know, you're trying to maybe just like, you know, uh, you know, active your community, you know, this uh, any exchange is kind of that. It might gonna cost you money, but actually, I couldn't give a fixed number about this because like, it's just like you are gonna raise your own stuff. You have a specific like plans like. Why you risk? Why you need to risk so much money? And what is gonna be? Uh, you know, where you're gonna spend the money? And yeah, it's kind of a this story. So for content, it's like we just like trying to you know, uh, uh, trying to increase like all these like content like a blockchain to everybody. So we also welcome everybody. If you feel like you know, you can check that our code on at GitHub, GitHub first and. Uh, if you have any like uh, you know any questions, you can contact us. So yeah. Yeah. So actually, on top of that, uh, I would like to add actually, uh, if you look at Nasdaq, right? So the most 
valuable company, the most highest ratio PE. <coughs> Yeah, all that. So basically, that is very expensive. That means high high value. But in blockchain, it's the other part. Technology in blockchain is actually almost free. But the most expensive part is the marketing, <coughs> is the regulation, is the compliance. So why that really happens is because of the whole, because of people actually speculating. You can raise this much of money, so I didn't charge you. Bloody high, but is that really true? Is that really worth your that money? I personally don't think that think so. So, um, the improvement of the blockchain is not our. It's not well on ourselves. I mean, uh, the, the project. It's not the tech part. It's actually the public. So the public awareness. You know, we we really open to how. Try not to at least you know the banks, the bankers, you know the media body. Try not to charge us so hard. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I think cost is always uh, a concern, right? Because uh, as a uh, oh, there's a question. Okay, great. So uh, as an uh, entrepreneur myself, I think I've always wanted to know about the cost. So if you say it's free, it's great. Uh, a question for Kenji. And it's a two-part question. So I was looking at your white paper, and I understand that you do crypto to fiat, crypto to crypto to fiat. So if you do crypto to crypto to fiat, how does the Exchange rates come in, like where do you charge? And also going back to the question that she raised, um, with your card payment system, can you only pay in cryptocurrency, or can you pay in fiat? Because if you do crypto to fiat, is it possible that at the store in Indonesia, I just do an instant conversion from crypto to fiat, then I send back to Rupiah? Would that get around the law? Oh, uh, I answer your first questions. Um, okay, the first question is uh, how we gonna do the settlement. So. Uh, we, we have to admit that that's the merchants still they, they want to they want to get fiat money instead of cryptos. We have to admit that. So how we gonna do that? So we will actually partner with the local exchange. So um, for example in Seoul, so in, in Korea, so we partner with uh, that local exchange which they have the fiat existing bond, so they can convert the crypto to fiat. So we work with them. They will we will co issue a card which is. Because we, we, we always see ourselves as Visa, so exchanges for in our, you know, from our perspective is they are banks. So we call a, a issue a card, then the, the the consumer can use this card, which they have got their balance in the exchange. For example, 10 Bitcoin to spend whatever new, they can get their Starbucks. That. So after that, we will deduct the money, the deduct the, 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 the token from the account in exchange and then the exchanges we actually sell it and then convert to fiat, convert to fiat and then send it to the merchant. That's how we did. So that's why um the nowadays that we will only focus in Japan, uh so uh probably Singapore, uh, uh Switzerland uh, and Philippines as well. So to answer your second question, so crypto to crypto to fiat. So that sounds a very workable solution. So but it's just that um our because payment is all about compliance. We were facing KYC ML every day. I mean, I got the email stuck in. How did you do the KYC stuff? So, um, of course, uh, crypto to crypto to fiat in Indonesia that works. That is work is workable at all because there's no law at, uh, currently at the moment. But do you, do you want to really step on it? Step on it. Uh, regulators would actually see the other ways. So if they feel you are not right then you are in trouble. And like I said, payments is all about compliance. You don't want this small fraction problem to kill the whole deal. So to answer your questions, um, it's workable theoretically, but we won't do that. Okay, so uh, I probably have a technical question. So the blockchain offers unparalleled uh, freedom for individuals. They are fully in control of their assets and are able to conduct peer-to-peer -peer transactions without middlemen and gatekeepers. However, in the past decade, they have become accustomed to having their hand held. Forgetting passwords and misplacing private keys will become an issue, especially as the technology <coughs> becomes more widely adopted. How does Quantum plan to address the issue of missing accounts, technical support, and administrative support? Probably, uh, how will be the best person to answer? Uh, I think this is a, also a very good question. Uh, so, uh, Quantum is based on uh, Bitcoin. So, the, the underlying currency layer is Bitcoin. So I think there's a lot of 
many lessons to learn from the Bitcoin community, and I think that question depends on how much money you're talking about, right? So if you're talking about like tens of millions of dollars, and of course you're gonna have to, you're gonna have, you're gonna want to, to uh, control your own keys, so you're gonna have to have like, multiple copies of keys in multiple geographic uh, locations. So there are companies, uh, Bitcoin companies doing this, like uh, there's one called Kingdom something, um, there's also a, a something called like Vaults in different places. Managing a lot of money. Uh, so for a smaller players, like thousands of dollars, or maybe like just hundreds of dollars, probably <laughs> you know, just keep, keep on exchange, right? Like, like I, I keep my money. So so keeping your money on exchange, you feel okay, right? I mean, I'm like I don't I'm like keep like keeping private keys is hard. Mm. Like, I, like for me myself, I don't even bother with it. I just put my money on exchange. <laughs> so. so <laughs> So you, you have Howard here saying that it's okay to keep money on the exchange. Okay, so uh, then with regards to uh, block, okay, so with regards to uh, investor side, maybe many investors are buying into products with little to no fundamentals due to marketing. Okay, a good example of a centralized platform would be Apple. Okay, so yes, they take 30% cut of each purchase, but the applications bots or slow or so have been vetted by vetted by Apple to ensure that it meets with industry regulations. Does quantum actually have something in place to safeguard this this uh, procedure? You know, like like uh, for example, uh, as I mentioned, there's a vetting process. Does quantum actually have a vetting process of any sort, or KYC? Um, um, no, not KYC, but more of the kind of projects that are being built on quantum. But of course, being that it's open source, it's very different, right? Anybody and everybody can build on quantum. But I think it's a matter of uh, more of a protecting another additional layer. So this is something that, uh, that I mean, it's a question based on like, okay, so the comparison is Apple has, uh, that they take a 30% cut of each purchase, right? But the applications bought or sold have been vetted by Apple to ensure that it meets with industry regulations. Okay, for example, no pornography, no malware. Are there such safeguards in place for quantum? Uh, no, it's a public chain, so no. Okay. So actually, it's the thing like the it's open source, right? So everyone you can just use the code. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's not called we, we call it like open source. So the things like uh, we might if you you know the good project we have our own team to review all their white paper, their codes, whether it makes sense or not. And if it's a really good one, we might we will support them from more tech part. Because like they might have some, you know, they are not that familiar to deploy their own products on quantum. So regarding to this part, we might, you know, ask our like developers and developers to give them some more specific, you know, uh, idea. Yeah, direction about that. Yeah. So for example, um, you guys have decided to uh, work with Panergo, right? So so or work with Polyans. I mean, I'm sure that there's this vetting system. So is there a perimeters or every project can have a potential, uh, could have that potential to be successful or at least has an, a certain appeal, but is there something with uh, a certain level of perimeters or something that quantum focuses on before deciding, incubating them or nurturing them? Is there a procedure like that? Um, actually, the first is like after we review all the white papers about everything, um, we we also talk with the team just like before Anaco, we might have some like go through more like uh, the ideas first and uh, after I mean actually because like this industry is quite new so no one gonna have a really like specific rules about like hey how I'm gonna incubate you or not and actually we are not an incubator we just give them more like you know direction and some strategy that kind of suggestions. That's what you can do because like, the thing like, because like, uh, we just like, you know, step one, one, one step, you know, before them. So we're just trying to uh, develop ourselves and trying to figure out, you know, a way and to see whether all the public gonna adopt it or not. So, yeah, so it's not just like the laws, like, oh, we just follow the laws because the law one is the laws that, the majority of people adopt the law as well. So that's we call the law. But right now we don't have really like, you know, uh, any any people can tell you like, oh, you couldn't do this, you can't do this. And it's not legal, it's legal. So the thing is like, why we also would love to see more healthy regulation come out. Like we might can 
uh, the public might have a more, you know, a uh, course to like what kind of like a, you know information they need to follow up to check. And yeah, we we try to also one of the you know this kind of information provider, and we try to be a sample about this. Yeah. Okay. So um, I have a, I have a question. So with regards to the blockchain space, cryptography, P two P network, there are there are certain industries that are uh, actually very well catered. For example, logistics, supply chain management, payment channels, wallet services, and whatnot. But are there other uh, industries that would very much suit the blockchain space at this moment. So insurance, for example, is also one of them, right? Like, or data management. So are there any industries that you are particularly interested in uh, that could potentially uh, uh, revolutionize their existing uh, system, for example? Because maybe their system is very dinosaur, right? Like a dinosaur. Uh, and yeah, that's what I just want to ask. Um, uh, I'm not an uh, expert from everything, so I uh, stand from the payment perspective. So what we're actually looking at is the credit label system. So you know we can spend everything because it's recorded on the blockchain. The merchants, how much their, their revenue could be. So this is a credit rating system um, which actually can build upon the blockchain. And then what's really interesting is that, in, like I said, in, in, for example in Indonesia, 30% of the people has bank account. Um, you, so, I mean, they don't have bank account, so they don't even have the track record of their credit history. So, which makes them very hard to uh, loan the money from, from a bank. So, they, 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 they are forced to go to those, you know, loan shark, you know, those, uh, those people who, you know, offer a very, very high interest. And then, um, the micro loans they are spending, spending in so, so from my uh, from my you know, perspective, so credit rating is one of the things we should definitely look into it. I think uh, maybe charity and donation stuff should be the next topic for oh, yeah. yeah. So how do I know that the, how do I know that the, the particular organization is it? I don't do yeah. much charity because I don't know. You see, yes. I, don't, I can't even validate whether really? that's a real website. Hey, really? I really don't know. Really? I would rather go directly and pass the check to that individual. Like for example, there are certain third world countries that as much as they have their own marketing video, but uh, at the end of the day, I don't know whether the money really goes to these children or this home. So yeah, maybe you can further add on that. Uh, because I'm, I'm thinking these people, they really need some help. And if we can really implement blockchain to help these people, I think that's the, that's the benefit to bring the blockchain to, to this area. So. Because um, to be honest, I think uh, like ninety percent of the current projects we're doing something, but maybe it really takes a while for the regulation and a lot of stuff infrastructure to definitely have. We can witness the business be the main business in the future society. But definitely, I think the charity and donation. Um, I mean, we don't have uh, some. Sacrificed uh, entity in, in it, and uh, every NGO or big organization, they all want to make it well. Because to be honest, if I someone just asked me if you want to donate like hundred dollars to the students, definitely I'm super eager to do this. But I definitely I don't trust this organization. That's the main problem for all, all the all the uh, all the public people. They they if they want to do something good. So I do think uh, if it's a good thing, why we cannot use the blockchain into it? And also, um, yeah, if we can use the like ten percent of the the blockchain technology to help all these ninety percent of people to bring more things, more education, more more clothes, why not? Right? Okay. Then the next one, I think, uh, with regards to one last question. I mean, question from me before we come to you. Uh, privacy. I think our our own personal data has always been uh, one way or another being utilized by uh, Facebook uh, or Instagram and whatnot, right? Because the moment you post it on social, uh, basically that particular platform owns it and they can do anything and everything they want. So with regards to uh, blockchain, can that actually help uh, from a privacy standpoint? Anybody can jump in with it. Maybe I'll offer my contrary opinion again. Uh, <laughs> So I think like there's a lot of uh, thoughts out there, you know, like people like just 
the common sense part, like I think that privacy is like one one of these like uh, scenario, right? That people look at Facebook and they get angry, right? And it's like, oh, just take my data and sell my data. I'm not very happy with it. But go back home, go on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and they still use Instagram, they still use WhatsApp. For plots, right? <laughs> so there's no there's no like late Instagram campaign going on. So I, I don't think people actually care about like privacy that much. So I think uh, like people like doing like focus. On, I, I think they, there is there is like a good argument for privacy, right? Especially in, in the case of say something like Zcash, right? So they focus on just uh, it's more a protection right? uh, against government like, people taking things away from you. But it's not so much about so I think there are two senses of privacy, and I'm a little more skeptical about privacy information about you, and I'm more um, interested in privacy as a protection. Right? I don't want like to talk to me. So it's a word. So, so, uh, so I think uh, with regards to that, does quantum actually have a privacy layer in built? It's, it's like a turnkey solution in the, in the sense that, for example, if I want privacy for my transactions, I can have that for uh, at the moment that's not available. Uh, the way uh, I look at it is... Okay, okay uh, maybe, maybe I make it sorry. a little bit more yeah, simple, yeah. like how I understand it. Let's say I'm building, some, uh, I'm building a business on your platform. So I would prefer to have uh, like ZK Snaps, right? ZK Snaps works in a certain way where um, maybe I want certain information to be available to this particular individual, but I still have to work with uh, C, uh, party C as well. But in order for everything to function, uh, I don't want party C to know something, but I want party party B to know it. So is there some something like that, like a certain kind of uh, yeah, function uh, that works? Quantum is not a privacy oriented chain, so that it, it doesn't really do that. So uh, okay. yeah. Oh, just to I mean, uh, so I heard there are some uh, provision chain. Okay, so for example, uh, normally we use it for the medical chain, so you upload your, you know, your, your generic, your biomedical stuff inside, so the, the, the chain, so uh, if when they go to, you know, come to over the, the hospital, so you can grant them the access key, then they will have the access of your medical reports, things like that. So I heard there's some improvement in stay, but um, I, like, sadly, I don't see any product yet, so. So maybe I'll just add a little bit, like, I said, I see that going forward in the future, there's going to be just interoper, uh, you can exchange between chains, right? So I think like pseudo anonymous is probably enough. Right? So even though all the transactions are traceable, you can always like run through your money and see if you actually come back. <laughs> okay, uh, so the gentleman in the... Yes, I, I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, follow up you know, from your earlier question on uh, how which industry is right for blockchain, right? So assuming that industry has decided, yes, that's the right, we, we should be in blockchain. I'm, I'm in banking, by the way. And, and how do you choose which blockchain? There's so many out there. Uh, what's special about quantum? Uh, besides free, um, I, I think you're gonna tell me fast. <laughs> so, uh, well, so uh, quantum is our consensus like POS. So which means that you are going to do your business is gonna help you to uh, reduce a lot like uh, the, the cost because like POW requires really high quality about the hardware, right? So that's the thing we can do. The other thing is like um, we, we are, quantum is a public chain. So and we are like POS like set, uh, decentralized. So which means our TPS is not higher than the consensus like DPoS or you know like kind of this like consensus because like um, but our our TPS is still higher than Ethereum and right now is like about two or three times up like kind of it. But what we're gonna do is like we are gonna do in deploying the lightning network in the future in our like technical roadmap. So which means it's it's gonna help you to. Uh, you know, uh, to give you more potential like chains to uh, enhance your transaction speed, and yeah. So, um, do you? Sure, sure. So, uh, this is one area I'm really interested in. Right. Um, I, I think like going going forward in the future, there's not going to be one chain. Right. So I think like 
either a bank or maybe it's just a, a federation of banks, you can always start your own chain. And that's not the point. I mean, I think the point is, it's going to be like upper, interoperability between chains. Like you have your, your chain inside your own currency and serves your own economy within your system. And there's another chain that serves their economy and their system. And there's a way to like, exchange between them. And that's enough. So I don't think it's necessary to have like this one single chain that does everything. So I think, uh, so that's one, one analogy to part, in the banking system is probably there's a global reserve currency, but we don't do our day-to-day -day transaction with extra dollars or something like that. So there's also national currency, and there's also credit, and these are like, interchangeable. I think that interchangeability is more important than which chains, which currency is the right currency. That's my, my, my opinion. But if I can um, ask further on your point, sure. how, how do you, in your business, how do you decide, and you decide you need blockchain, right? How do you decide which blockchain? Uh, all the names are so cool, right? Quantum, Neo, it's all, it's all sci-fi, you know? <laughs> right? So, you know, it's all short. Oh. <laughs> it's really what tolerance you want, and uh, you just, like, just match your tolerance and make a list. Qualities you want, and just do a do another Excel sheet. <laughs> 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 just check your boxes. <laughs> it's like so uh, like uh, all the state. So not you know that's one solution for everything. So okay, so for me for payment, you are looking for higher CPS for instant confirmation. So for me for medical, you need a uh, total privacy. So for me for supply chain, you need to have a transparent chain. So um. I, I believe uh, in, the, in the near future, so there will be like in this industrial, they will have a certain chain for you know to fulfill the certain requirements and you couldn't let in let vendors into everything, right? Yeah. I mean, that doesn't mean. Yeah. So, so, I think like, so I think like the public chains like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Quantum, they are more like reserve, like find the settlement layers. Like at the very end, you settle your all your records and you digest all your records onto the public chain. So that sort of proof that you're not cheating, and then just do the daily things on your own thing. So do you want to take an ad? Yes, yes, I will come to it like in the ground. And uh, the question keeps coming in every kind of uh, decision making whether we should go with public and private because banking is still very skeptical to touch something on the public chain. And most of us, I mean, whatever uh, I know, just my colleagues and other banks as well. Uh, we are more focused on the private chain uh, and go with the conversion and ask the uh, maybe hyperledger, for, for example, we are doing something on hyperledger. So I think for a starting point, if, if you're really keen, uh, private chain is something which might be a starting point, but once this interoperability issue gets resolved, I think the ecosystem communication becomes very much easy and you can easily communicate. But that might take some more time. There are a lot of chains which are working on this, but I don't think they are connecting yet. Thank you for your introduction, Maria. Okay, so uh, uh, based on uh, the difference between, of course, private chains and uh, public chains, I think there's always room for growth on both sectors, right? Uh, because not uh, not every uh, every business has a unique uh, solution or uh, uh, offer of MV, uh, MVP or minimum viable product. So. I think at the end of the day, as uh, what uh, Howard has mentioned, it's just about taking your, the boxes and understanding uh, for your business what do you require. And then from then, that's when you start uh, asking yourself, do you want to build on the, uh, on the public blockchain or on a private blockchain? That's how you kind of assess things. Um, with regards to that, uh, I think uh, we have come to the end of the segment. Uh, thank you guys so much for uh, coming by. And uh, thank you so much for the panel. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.